So, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, today I have the wonderful opportunity to sit down with uh, one of my favorite uh, piano players um, and uh, a real great cat on the scene, Steve Kuhn. Now, Steve, I don't know. Yet. I know you don't have too much time, but um, I want to talk about uh, some history because you're a great part of history. You, you worked with some real legends, and for young musicians such as myself. Any stories that you have to share are real gems for us. So, um, uh, some of the people that uh, mean a lot to uh, me include John Coltrane and Scott LaFaro. So, those two people I'd like to talk about. First, I'd like to talk about uh, LaFaro. And uh, I know you studied at the Atlantic School of Music and probably got a chance to be around uh, uh, Bill Evans a little bit. But um, how did you? Uh, get in touch with Scott and how do you work with Scott because he's such a talent on bass. Uh, it was after the Lennox School in 1959. Wow. I graduated from Harvard and went, got a scholarship to the Lennox School in the summer of that year. And then I, in September of that year, I went to New York. Wow. Uh, and uh, at some point, I don't know, somewhere in late 59, I don't remember, I met Scotty. Uh, just, you know, just musicians, they, you meet, you hear about this one and that one, and I don't remember where we met or anything like that, but I remember uh, hearing a lot about him. Um, I, I know he was working with Booker Little at the time. I, I, at the old five spot, I, I, I met them there. And, uh, um, we just... Uh, I think we must have played a little bit together. I don't remember, but it was an instant connection for me, uh, just in terms of his what he heard and how I reacted to what he played, and vice versa. And yeah, it was an, he was an extraordinary talent, uh, and uh, you know what he's influenced the whole generation of bass players. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I mean, and it's it's extraordinary because he really didn't start playing the bass till he was eighteen or nineteen years old, and he was tragically left yeah, us at 25 so very, very tragic in a, pageant, in a period of five or six years i mean it's, it's extraordinary what he did yeah um and he was like a big brother to me he was two years older than i and uh we uh i think in 1961 uh stan gets contacted him uh, stan was living in, in denmark or sweden at the time and he wanted to come back and work and he called or got in touch with scott and said uh, I'd like you to work with me. And Scotty said, well, if I could put a trio together that I'd like. And, and so he called me wow. and he called Pete LaRocca. Wow. And we met with Stan at the Village Vanguard one afternoon, Sunday afternoon. Yeah. And we played together and Stan hired us just like that. And That's uh, fantastic. So that was you know, the beginning of that relationship uh, with Scotty. Uh, we had done some playing before, but uh, with Stan it, it was more steady. and, mm. and uh, he uh, he was a very strong-willed person. He knew what he liked. He knew what he didn't like. But um, we did, we, the first job we had with Stan was at a place in Chicago on the south side, the Sutherland Lounge. Mm. We were there for two weeks, and at the end of the two weeks, uh, Scotty was not happy with Pete LaRocca because he, he was just hearing cymbals. He wasn't hearing the drums, mm -hmm. and Scotty was very yeah. sensitive to. So he said to Stan, you know, I, and he was also working with Bill at the time. So he was back and Bill he was wasn't busy, working. Yeah. It was between Bill and Stan. Bill was there. He said to Stan, if, you know, I, I really am having trouble with Pete. Um, well, Stan said, well, do you want me to get another drummer? And uh, Scotty said, well, if you want me to stay, yes. Who? Roy Haynes. Wow. So Stan hired Roy Haynes. Wow. And that was the group until Scott was killed uh, with the automobile accident wow. in uh, July of that year. It must have been hard, man. It must have been uh, Well, we were, <laughs> we were working uh, upstate New York one week, and Scott had taken that week off because he's from upstate New York, and he was helping his mother uh, move to California. Some members in his family, I don't know. So he took the week off. We were working up in Saranac Lake, Historic. Uh, the phone rings eight, nine o'clock in the morning, and Stan says the Joe Glazers just called him, and he heard 
on the AP wire and Associated Press that jazz bassist Scott LaFarra was killed in an automobile accident. And I'm, you know, I'm half asleep. I said, are you out of your mind? Are you serious? And sure enough, wow. we were close enough where we were working. I think it was Jimmy Garrison who took his place for that week. <clears throat> we were close enough so we could drive to the funeral. And uh, it was, uh, the casket was closed because he was burned so, so badly in the accident. Oh, wow. That's hard, man. Um, it was, I couldn't believe it. And really for me, that was the first major loss in my life in terms of, because we were like brothers. Uh, yeah. And uh, to this day, I mean, it's, I'm still in touch with his sister. She wrote a wonderful book about Sky. I don't know if you, if you had this book. No, I, I got it. Got it's it. a Texas, University of Texas to, Press. Okay. About his life. It's, yeah. You should get it if you want. I would love to do that. And, uh, she lives in Los Angeles. Okay. Aline Fernandez is her name. Cool. And uh, so, but it was uh, yeah, it's extraordinary hard, talent you know. and a, just a, tra a tragedy. You know, I had a similar thing happen to me with a friend. Uh, a drummer died uh, 21 car accident. You know, it's hard. But thanks for that. Uh, just want to talk a little bit about Coltrane because I, as you promised, uh, you tell us a little bit about how you started working with Coltrane and. Uh, some some history with Coltrane. Well, I was working with when I first came to New York. I had met at the Lennox School. Uh, uh, Kenny Dorm was one of the teachers up there. I met him there, and when I came to New York, I called. I checked into the Bryant Hotel, which is at Fifty Fourth and Broadway, mm -hmm. which is a block and a half north of the original Birdland. Yeah, yeah. And uh, I called people I had known from when I was living in Boston. And also people I'd met at Lennox. Yeah. You know, Kenny was one I called and I said, I'm here if you're here, if anybody needs a piano player. And he said, well, as a matter of fact, he, he was looking for somebody because uh, the pianist he had, I don't remember, but he had a job out in Brooklyn at a place called the Turbo Village in Bed-Stuy. Okay. Yeah. And he hired me and uh, wow. I worked out with, with Kenny, uh, worked with him until I had heard Coltrane was John was leaving Miles' his band and he was looking to put a, a group together. Yeah. So out of the blue, and I'm basically really shy, I call I got his number and I called him and I said, I know you don't know who I am, but I'm currently working with Kenny Dorm and I'd love it if we could just get together sometime and just talk or <coughs> play some music or something. Yeah. So he a few days a week went by, I don't remember. He must have asked around about me and he called me one day at the Bryant Hotel, and he said, I got a studio a couple of blocks from here. Let's meet at the studio. They had an upright piano, mm -hmm. a couple of chairs, a small room. Sure. And we got together, and we played a little together and talked, and that was it. Nothing was said, yay or nay. Mm -hmm. A week or so later, he calls me at the hotel and asked me if I would come out to where he was living in Hollis, Queens. He was married to Naima. Yeah. Nita, well, yeah, as called, the at the time. Famous song, Naima, yeah. And uh, so I took the subway out to Hollis, Queens. Naima made dinner for us, and again we sat and talked and played. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> then he drove me back to the Bryant Hotel. Still nothing, yes or no, or nothing. And then about a week or so later, the phone rings at the Bryant, and uh, hello, see? It's John, uh, and I, I'll never forget this. He said, "Put $135 a week, be okay to start." Wow! <laughs> and I was making 100 a week with Kenny. So, yeah. I mean, aside from the raising, yeah. and, and just the, the chance to play with him, and so of course he had been booked in a club called the Jazz Gallery, which is on the Lower East yeah. Side in New York. And I think he was booked for two two weeks or four weeks. I don't remember because everybody was. He was leading yeah. miles and he was very hot at the time. So uh, we started working uh, there and four weeks made, went into six, eight. He wound up working there 26 weeks straight, wow. which is unheard of. A half a year in the same club, <laughs> six nights a week. I was I lasted eight to ten weeks and then McCoy Tyner joined the band. But, okay. but uh, those eight or ten weeks, I'll never forget. I mean, it, was just, yeah. it was magic to play yeah. with him. Pete LaRocca was the drummer, and Steve Davis from Philadelphia, I think a cousin of John's, was the bassist. <clears throat> but it was extraordinary. 
I mean, I never, I never yeah. experienced that kind of electricity on a bandstand before. Wow. Literally, in his solo, in the middle of his solos, people would be standing up as in a church meeting, you know, and they were clapping and screaming and carrying on. It was unbelievable. It's, it's fantastic. I, you know, it's uh, so it's it been a dream come true to work with him. And um, it was extraordinary. Any, really. any like, uh, any statement he said to you at any point in time that that stands out or. I was not happy. I was 21 at the time. I was not. I'm sorry, 23. Okay. 1961. Yeah, I would have been 23. I was trying to find my own voice, and I was really not happy with what I was doing. And I, during the period I was with him, I said, John, if, if, if there's anything you'd like me to do that I'm not doing, or things that I'm doing that you don't want me. To and I, again, I'll never forget. He said, "I respect you too much as a, as a musician to tell you how to play." Really? But there are things that he he would. When I heard McCoy with him, I realized McCoy sort of laid down a carpet for him, off of which he could spring. And a lot of times, I was out there with him, improvising and trying to just. So it was, in a way, probably getting in his way. Or, okay. I mean, I was doing yeah, the comping, yeah, yeah. the traditional comping, but also I was doing other things, trying to find my own voice and. <clears throat> Excuse me, but uh, it's and he was very interested in 20th century contemporary classical music at the time. So he and I was into a lot of that stuff. So he was always asking me about Carlos, uh, Carline, uh, Carl Stock, Stockhausen, Carline. Okay. Yeah. And Pierre Boulez and mm. uh, it's a Greek uh, Zanakis who was a contemporary composer. A lot of mathematics involved in it. But he was very interested in what was going on in the cool. classical world. Yeah. So, and I, you know, as much as I could tell him, which isn't that much, but he was very interested. And I saw him a couple of times after I left, and then I went to live in Sweden. I never saw him. Mm. While I was living in Sweden, I heard that he had passed. But, uh, uh, it was a, a time, just those eight or two months, whatever it was, uh, I'll always, you know, just, he was really the first, well, I shouldn't say that, the second person I met in the, in business. Gunther Schuller was the first yeah. I'd met at Lennox in 59 and then John who had the, such a complete devotion to the music. They weren't interested in, in drinking or getting, John was as straight as a pin at that time. Wow. Um, he was just about, was the, the, when he wasn't eating or sleeping, he had the horn in his mouth. And, and Gunther <laughs> had the same kind of dedication to the music. It was, it was very inspiring yeah. to be around. They weren't chasing women and doing drugs, and it was it was really I mean, music was their woman. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, John had an addictive personality, obviously, because he had some issues yeah. prior to that. So I, I'll always remember that he, he as he had a sweet tooth, and he would be he'd buy these butter rum lifesavers, mm. and he'd be constantly popping them in his mouth, <laughs> and you can always smell on his breath when you're talking with him. That it's the butter rum and the wow. lifesavers. Wow. But uh, not any that he never said much. He was very yeah. quiet. And, but there's something that involves Scotty as well. There was uh, when we were with Stan Getz in 1961, yeah. and, and John was still doing some. He had some, some things with Miles. He had to do. Mm. He couldn't get out of it completely. And so we were following them. Uh, Miles would be in, in Los Angeles, and then we would play at the same club. Then they went to San Francisco, they played, and then we followed them. So there was, in San Francisco, there was one time, there was an overlap. Yeah. We got there the day before, early, but we were all staying at the same motel. Mm. And I remember Scotty and I walking in the mo uh, outside the motel, Yeah. and we passed by John's room, and John's practicing, of course. Mm. And we just stood there, outside his door, <laughs> listening to him practice, which was mesmerizing. You know? Yeah. Yeah, and uh, Scotty wow. played with, had a chance to play with him too a little bit. He he was uh, he liked Scotty very much. Yeah, and, that's. Uh, but to listen to somebody practice, it's just, yeah. you know, I mean, that's 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 such a, a naked experience. It's almost like you're watching a, a naked woman uh, <laughs> get undressed, <Wow. laughs> keyboard or something. <laughs> that's, uh, John, uh, did, you, uh, you, did he like so to hear you guys so you're practice? Young, younger guy. Yeah. <laughs> Did he like to hear you guys? Like, uh, did he did he check in on you guys sometimes when you guys were? Not that I'm aware of. Mm. I don't know. But I, I know Miles did that with with Scotty just walking by, and we hear the horn, 
and we just stopped. And yeah, he's yeah. playing. We, I don't know. We must have stayed out there for yeah. half an hour or whatever. Wow. Yeah, you know, Ravi uh, told a story once about John sitting down at the traffic light playing the flute. And he wouldn't move until he finished playing what he worked out. And the whole traffic was honk, honk, honk. And he was sitting there. He, could, he couldn't move until he had finished it. He was the right one. You know, Steve, uh, thanks so much for uh, sharing that with us. You know, that's uh, such an uh, important thing for us, who, us musicians who want to get a little close to these uh, legends of this music. And uh, you are a giant who walked among giants. Wow. Thank so, you, thank you. you know, thank you for, for sitting down with us. Before I finish, um, could you just tell us, for young musicians and pianists or jazz musicians who are watching this, uh, what's one important piece of advice that you'd like to share with us before we finish? It's a very difficult being a musician or an artist of any kind, painter, sculptor, whatever. It's a very, very difficult, difficult life. Having said that, if it's in your heart of hearts to do it, you've got to just follow it. You've got to go with it. And at some point you may realize, well, this is really not for me, or this is for me, and you just continue. It's, it's, a, it's not an easy road at all, but uh, it really depends. A lot of times during, during, along the way I was tempted to just give it up and do something else because it, it was hard. It's, it's, it still is to a certain extent, but back in the days when in my 20s, and it's, it was really difficult. There's a lot of temptation, a lot of a lot of drugs around in those days, and just fortunately I did my share, but I was able to get out of it completely. And That's thank great, goodness. Man. But if it, if follow your heart, follow your, listen to your heart, and uh, at some point you'll know whether this is what you want to do. And you have to support the music too. By I did a number of years playing commercial jobs, studio work, and stuff like that playing for private parties, yeah. uh, you just, or, and teaching, and a lot of, I still teach privately, but uh, you just, it's very hard to, to do, to make a living. I had made a decision many years ago uh, not to get married, because unless I was with a woman who was financially independent, I couldn't yeah. support a family, yeah. Yeah. and I didn't want to have that pressure, so consequently, uh, I got married when I was 50. Wow. And it, but it lasted only four, four months, but that was, <laughs> I figured I'd try it. And, well, yeah, I mean, that's, but in any a, case, that's I mean, a story it, for another time, I'm sure. Yeah, but it's, uh, it's, it's really, it's a difficult life. But again, if, it's, it, if you feel it and you, this is what you want to do, mm. you've got to go all out and try to do it. Yeah. Well, Steve, uh, thanks so much, man. Uh, You're very welcome. Thank th you. Thanks for sitting down with us. It was a real pleasure. And uh, I'm, I'm sure we'll cross paths again, hopefully. I hope so. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.